What's going on my friends? I am Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U and today we're going to talk about the story of Zinsco Electric. Now, before we get into it, please subscribe. If you watch all these videos, you're really helping me out. Um, hit the little subscribe button, hit the notification bell. It lets you know every time I have a new episode, please like the episode. And if you're feeling extra spunky, hit the join button, join the channel membership. There's all kinds of extra benefits. You get extra posts, little video clips of things that are behind the scenes that nobody else really gets to see. Um, plus you're helping a brother out. So let's get into it. All right, in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, is when Zinsco was formed. So there was a father and son duo, Martin and Martin Zinsmeyer, that formed a company. Really what they did is there was another company called the Frank Adam Electric Company that had stock on the East and West Coast um, of electrical distribution equipment. And then when the Great Depression hit, they uh, bought out half of this company's stock, so the whole West Coast of the stock, and that got them into the electrical distribution game. Then in 1943, the son buys the father out, he renames the company Zinsco Electric, and immediately starts uh, designing circuit breakers and panels. Um, the first editions were made out of copper. They had copper bus bars and copper breaker clips, so where the breaker actually uh, clipped into the bus was copper. Um, and then as time went on, like this was, you know, World War II era. So like during World War II, there was a huge shortage of copper. You, we weren't able to use uh, gold and silver and copper as much in manufacturing processes because there was such a, a small supply of it going towards, everything was going towards the war effort. So it was really expensive. Um, so a lot of companies started to try to change things. And this is when 1942, I believe is in the National Electric Code is when they started adopting uh, aluminum codes, basically allowing for things like aluminum conductors and aluminum alloy bus bars and things like that. And then in 1952, another shortage happened. So the Korean War had the, the very same effect. So at this point, a lot of these companies were like, all right, we're tired of screwing with these copper shortages because tons of them have had, had happened up until this point and they were going to continue happening as history shows us. Um, so a lot of them just changed over and started making all of their components and their bus bars and breakers with aluminum alloys rather than copper. Um, Zinsco didn't. Zinsco during this time still kept with the copper designs and it wasn't until like, I think the early 60s when when they started to change everything out um, because they too were just sick of uh, all of it. But I think Schneider Square D uh, at the time was also still just continuing to use copper uh, while most of the other brands just changed ship. And then in the 60s is when they started to change their designs to the aluminum alloy. The next big thing, really the biggest thing for Zinsco was they designed a product that nobody else had designed before. Um, so in 1963, there was a breaker that they called the R38 and uh, it was a, a, essentially a two pole breaker for 220 circuits, but instead of it taking up two slots, it takes up one slot. This was like wildly popular because it allowed you to get more circuits in a panel or to be able to add to existing panels, add circuits uh, with, you know, with uh, if you had space constraints, essentially, um, you could put more things in a space. So not only was it 220, but they also had single pole where there was two single pole breakers. Like this one has a 20 amp red and a 15 amp blue, um, which there are problems with that, not having common handle ties and all of that. We'll get into that in a later video. But it was a product that kind of like blew them up. It was such a popular thing. So the next 10 years, like Zinsco just blew up. They did really, really well. And in 1973, they were approached by GTE Sylvania and uh, the Zinsmeyers actually sold Zinsco to GTE Sylvania. So GTE took over and then about five years later, 1978, GTE changed the brand Zinsco to the brand Challenger. So it just became a different product, still owned by GTE, um, but it was now just Challenger panels rather than Zinsco panels. Then in 1981, GTE Sylvania decides like, we're done with electrical distribution. We are gonna sell off all of our assets, all of our manufacturers or uh, manufacturing you know, facilities, products, everything. Um, so they sell everything off, kind of close the doors, but one of the GTE officers or executives take some of their stuff and uh, starts a different company. The company's called the Challenger Electrical Equipment Corporation. Um, 
And he continues to make the breakers, but actually closes down the Zinsco panels and stops the production of Zinsco, but is still making uh, breakers that can go into the older Zinsco systems. Now, during this time, the Challenger brand is still doing really, really well. Um, so well that they start to design different products that can be incorporated with other manufacturers' breakers. So like Murray is another uh, breaker that you'll see a lot of the time. Um, you'll see Krauss Heinz. Um, there's some breakers that kind of like fit within each other that are all really like relatively the same size and that's where this whole thing started um, but challenger continued to do really well because of that because they were making products that could fit with other brands as well this continued until the mid 90s so in 1994 um, they were doing so well nationwide that westinghouse approached them and actually bought them out but the reason that westinghouse wanted to buy them out was not because they wanted anything to do with them themselves. They were trying to build a multi-asset kind of deal that they could sell a whole bunch of electrical distribution to Eaton. So the Eaton Corporation, if you like, you guys know Eaton, Eaton's still around today. They're a really big company. So the Zinsco company was not around anymore. The Zinsco buses and everything were not being produced. Um, there was Challenger and Chal the Challenger line of equipment was still being made and it was owned by Eaton. Now at this time there were other companies so Challenger itself was still making their products and Thomas and Betts were making uh, products as well but they were both making Zinsco products. They were making breakers for Zinscos. So even though the company was not around there were still people making replacement breakers and, and maintaining the intellectual property and the molds and everything to be made for the breakers. So the breakers continued being made under different UL standards and that kind of brings us up to today so up until about 2005 um, these companies were still making these breakers and then Thomas and Betts decided they were done making the breakers um, Connecticut Electric came in and bought the intellectual property so now Connecticut Electric which is who this breaker is actually owns the intellectual property and is making breakers under a new standard so these are not the same breakers as these because these have a high failure rate um, the, these there's been a whole bunch of new uh, manufacturing and things that have been done to make sure that they're up to the modern standards so what are the problems what do we need to know about Zinsco with Zinsco, there's not as much of a crazy, like dramatic story as there was with the Federal Pacific line in the last video that I did. Click here, uh, you can watch that. But there was still a very high failure rate in the products. So there was a lot of breakers that just wouldn't trip. There was a lot of, there are two pole breakers, specifically the R38. They're like mega super awesome product that made them famous, had a really, really high failure rate. And so a lot of times if one of the poles would trip, the other one wouldn't. So it would still keep the breaker engaged. Um, a lot of them were tested at 135%. They would run 135% current through for like an hour or for up to eight hours and it still wouldn't trip. There was 200%. Uh, which would be a short circuit where they didn't trip. Um, but really the big thing that a lot of people complained about was either the breakers starting to melt because a bunch of heat was, was uh, happening where the actual breaker clip snaps into the bus bar. It just didn't seat very well. Plus a lot of the older like panels, different areas of, of aluminum, aluminum, you know, expands and contracts and oxidates a lot. Um, the copper bus bars, same thing. Copper doesn't oxidize as, as, much as aluminum does, but there were just problems with how they were snapping in. Federal Pacific has the same thing. It's really just how the breaker was designed to mate up with the bus bar. And a lot of times it just created an excess amount of heat. It was just like a, a super high resistance environment and it would uh, create points of heat and start melting the breaker and the breaker wouldn't itself have uh, strong enough mechanisms or good enough mechanisms inside to trip the breaker. So the breakers would often start a fire or start, you know, melting the insulation off the conductors and it wouldn't trip. And then somebody would smell like burning and they'd go out to the panel and uh, <laughs> be glowing red hot, but not trip. So um, that was essentially the big problem. They would test these at 135% of current, 200% current. A lot of them wouldn't trip. Um, so the UL standard nowadays, 489, again, I talk about this more in depth in the other video, but breakers are tested at 100%, 135%, and 200%. Really, the, the big problems that were tested on these is a lot of them were not tripping at 135%, which is where a thermal overload or a thermal trip should happen. It's basically when on a 20 amp breaker, if you creeps up to like 27 amps, by 27 amps after, I don't know, like an hour, the breaker should trip. 
or you know less than an hour but it should get to the point where it senses thermally that there is a problem and it trips that's one way a breaker trips the other way a breaker trips is if it senses up to 200 percent of its current so at 200 percent that's more like what a short circuit would be so a 20 amp breaker having 40 amps of current all of a sudden go through it's probably a short so it should trip um, from the research that Dr. Ehrenstein did and a lot of his articles on Inspectopedia, I recommend you guys go to Inspectopedia and look up. There's a lot of articles on this stuff. Um, but he was finding a lot of errors at 135%. Not so much. It didn't seem like in the research that there was uh, a lot of problems at the 200%. It was mainly just the handles um, that were having issues not tripping together or at 135% current. The thermal overload part wasn't tripping, um, but it seemed like maybe the short circuit part of it uh, was still at least mostly functional. And then lastly, a breaker needs to uh, make sure that it doesn't trip at 100%. So there's the 100, 135, and 200. Um, it needs to trip at 135, trip at 200, and hold at 100. So obviously if you're running 20 amps through 20 amp breaker, it shouldn't trip, right? So that's the other metric. All right, so my conclusion as always is going to be to tell everybody replace these panels if you come across a zinsco panel if you come across a pushmatic a wadsworth challenger federal pacific the best thing to do because they're dangerous as fuck is to replace them so we need to be telling everybody teaching when you go to a customer's house and you see one of these you know zinsco panels tell the customer be like hey these things have a huge failure rate it's a safety concern. I would recommend replacing the entire panel or multiple panels or service or whatever. Problem is a lot of customers can't afford that. They just need a simple fix to a problem. In which case I always recommend use a brand new manufactured circuit breaker. You can get these things at Big Electric Supply. There's actually a code in the description below, uh, code electrician U. You can go to Big Electric Supply and you can actually buy these. You get a discount on them. Um, or you can go to Home Depot. They've got them in Home Depot. So like be, use brand new stuff don't be taking stuff off of old panels and keeping it in your truck for that one service call that you might need it to keep granny's lights on or whatever i get it we all have done that um, but it's better to be replacing breakers uh, with brand new stuff that are manufactured to current ul standards than to be using old stuff that is definitely a part of a huge failure rate uh, problem so I want to thank everybody, the 480 volt members especially. I'm going to thank you once. Thank you. And then I'm going to thank you twice because I missed it last week. <laughs> thank you. All right, my dudes. Make sure that you join the channel. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the notification. Notification. Blah, well, notification bell. Uh, hit like, please. Love you crazy people. And I will see you in the next episode. Best can't music and video.